Good morning, everybody. Many thanks for taking the time to spend just short of an hour with us today to go through the COVID-19 training and awareness for you as management to share with your teams um, in, on your various farms. We thank you all for your participation and contribution to this training to date. Um, as much of the, your insight together with various colleagues' insights from across the African continent have contributed to supporting us in developing this material as well as understanding some of the challenges and insights that, that you may have had um, in terms of communicating to your team. So we um, we'll start off with telling you about which communication materials you have and just revisit what coronavirus and COVID-19 is. We'll take you through prevention and awareness as well as transmission, how to keep safe at work, how to keep safe at home, together with a few stigmas that we've more recently seen, um, and then most importantly, how to manage an outbreak on the farm should you have more than, than one case. Um, and then we'll take you through vaccines, which are obviously much more current at the moment. We then have a very short two minute questionnaire for you to go through covering some of the content coming out of this presentation. And should you be successful and achieve over 70%, we will then send you a Response Med certified certificate confirming that you have attended this training and been successful. Many thanks for your time. We hope that you find this useful. In terms of the communication materials, uh, we have developed a number that you will find online, um, including this presentation, together with outbreak management SOPs and reporting forms that you can use in the event of an outbreak, awareness posters that you can put up on the farms in English, Swahili, Shona and Amharic, and audio visual clips um, covering the various topics that we're going to take you through together with a text messaging campaign. As already communicated, uh, you, you, we will then end off with a very short questionnaire for you to, to um, complete online. We need to thank the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office managed by Mark McDonald for their support in this COVID-19 response fund and supported by Partner Africa and ETI in terms of rolling it out to all of you. So we thank them for their contribution. So what is coronavirus? We had many coronaviruses around before we heard the term COVID-19. Um, and they are viruses that circulate among animals, but some of them are also known to affect humans. At the end of 2019, we saw a new coronavirus entering into the world, starting in China. Um, and this new strain had not previously been seen before. This strain, was um, called COVID-19 and 18 months down the line, we are obviously all now very familiar with the term and what symptoms present themselves in the event of being infected with COVID-19. We know that we can have coughs, fevers, body aches, no taste or smell and tiredness. We've seen that no taste and smell is a, a symptom that a number of people aren't aware of in terms of it being linked to coronavirus, COVID-19. So please share these symptoms with your, your team members. We do know that COVID-19 is a respiratory illness. So we know that it's transmitted through respiratory droplets and obviously those droplets are more intense should we cough or sneeze or exhale or be in a stuffy crowded room with a number of people. 
We also know that older people and those people with underlying medical conditions like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease and cancer are more likely to develop serious illness. Another point that's really important to share is that a high percentage of positive cases are asymptomatic. Asymptomatic means that somebody has no symptoms. So you can go for a COVID-19 test and you can have no symptoms, you feel normal like you do every day and you are COVID-19 positive. Whilst this might not be a challenge for you in terms of how you physically feel, it is a challenge in terms of the fact that you are positive and you have the potential to spread COVID-19 because you are positive and because it's a highly infectious disease. So we know already that to pre prevent it, we need to wear our masks properly over our nose and our mouth. We need to be distant between people of one and a half to two meters. We need to clean surfaces and disinfect them often with bleach or soap and water. We need to wash hands properly for a minimum of 20 seconds. If we, if we are able to, we can hand sanitize and we need to ventilate room, rooms as best possible. Keep windows open, doors open. Additionally, we've seen vaccines as, an, as a more recent contribution to prevention, and we will touch on that a little bit later. What is important is because of the resp respiratory infection, we need to be aware of the things we touch on a daily basis. So we touch many tools at work, we touch stationery in terms of pens, we use our phones, we share our phones, we always need to clean and disinfect those shared items. When handing over documents or writing in registers, you need to sanitize your hands before or afterwards. The less distance you have between yourself and another person, the more you need to wear your mask. The more time you spend in common areas, the more you need to wash your hands. So in terms of some of the questions that we see people asking is, can we not only wash our hands for 10 to 15 seconds? No, we need to wash them for a minimum of 20 seconds. Another point that many people have commented on is that surely we only need to wear a mask. Um, and whilst we are not vaccinated and still building immunity within our countries and on the farms, a mask is not enough. We need to continue to wear a mask, distance, as well as wash our hands. Um, it's very, very important that we do them all together. Here is a small AV for you to watch, taking you through prevention and awareness. COVID-19 is a respiratory disease caused by a virus. Anyone can be infected. The virus is spread when an infected person coughs, sneezes, speaks or breathes and someone is too close and inhales droplets. Symptoms include dry cough, fever, difficulty breathing, sore throat, runny nose, tiredness and loss of taste and smell. If you have any of these symptoms, stay at home, talk to your manager and seek medical advice. How do we protect ourselves and others? Wear a mask covering your mouth and nose in public. Frequently wash hands with soap for 20 seconds or use hand sanitizer. Keep 1.5 meter physical distance. Avoid crowded places. Avoid shaking hands, kissing and hugging. Regularly clean commonly touched surfaces and objects. Ventilate as many spaces as possible by opening windows and doors. Don't touch your mouth, nose or eyes with unwashed hands. Let's all follow preventative measures to stay safe. COVID. Moving on to transmission, which we've touched on in that audio visual clip. I think this visual explains um, and illustrates the significance of respiratory droplets. We don't realize how when we cough and sneeze, how our droplets can spread 
and, and large spray droplets like we're seeing here can spread for, for many meters. As we can see in this illustration, a cough can travel 10 meters per second and a sneeze up to 50 meters per second. So that is what makes rooms where in a risk um, in terms of being too close to people, as well as exhalation and looking, looking at how droplets can both transmit in the air as well as land on surfaces. In terms of wearing a mask, this picture illustrates what um, it looks like from a respiratory point of view if we wear no masks, if we wear one mask, and if we wear two masks. Many of the fabric masks that you will now have have a minimum of two layers. And we also see a number of the blue disposable surgical face masks being worn. And those obviously also have sufficient layers. So we've spoken about the transmission of droplets um, and how the current scientific understanding is that the virus is mainly spread from person to person through the air and these droplets might enter into somebody's eyes, nose or mouth, particularly when you're in close proximity. Another thing we know is that it may be possible for the virus to spread from contaminated surfaces or objects. So again, you might sneeze onto your phone or onto a pen or a board that you're using at work and that, that those respiratory droplets can survive on those items, which again is why we need to follow all of the preventative measures as well as clean surfaces regularly. So to give you an idea of how long these droplets can survive on surfaces based on the evidence that we have to date, surface to person transmission is a risk. It's obviously more of a risk based on its particle dependency, which means how many particles fall on a surface and obviously more particles will fall on a surface after sneezing or coughing. So it might not be an issue if there's a small bit of the virus, but we understand that, that if there are many particles, you do run the risk of, of touching it and then transferring it to, to your eyes, nose and mouth. On metal, we've, we've seen that the virus can survive for one to nine days. On wood, like crates and wooden tool handles, we've seen that the virus can survive up to four days. On cleaning cloths, three days. On plastics, like plastic strip access to cold storage, plastic crates, cutting boards, fruit punnets, knife handles, plastic sleeves, transport vehicle, gear sticks, mobile phones. We've seen that the virus can last for up to three days on things like shipping boxes up to 24 hours and stainless steel up to three days. As mentioned, this is particle dependent but we need to, to be aware and we need to make our teams aware. We also need to reinforce to our teams that the, the majority of cases we're seeing are suspected to be person-to-person -person spread, but the risk of surface-to-person spread is there. So in terms of the transmission risks that you have at work on a daily basis, um, where you might not be able to maintain physical distance uh, or where working surfaces or tools are shared. You obviously catch your transportation to work and if you're in a motatu, taxi, bus, um, it's important that you open the windows, try and sit next to the window. When you arrive at farm, there may be areas um, that you need to touch canteen areas in terms of cups and utensils, greenhouse areas in terms of tools and registers, sorting and packing areas with stainless steel and scales, warehousing, and again, transportation of goods 
um, in terms of carport boxes and, and driving. So looking at a couple of questions coming out of, coming out of this section is another one that we've had from a few groups we've trained is, can the COVID virus spread through drinking water? There's currently no evidence to suggest this. And am I at risk of getting COVID-19 from services such as paper and plastic? You've just seen that this may be possible, um, though it's not thought to be the main reason. Should you want to research more of these kinds of issues and questions, you need to do so credibly. And the two main uh, internet sources that you can find are the World Health Organization, WHO, and CDC, the Center for Disease Control. They have very credible, up-to-date information that can answer all of your or your team's questions. So, a few visuals just to highlight what we've, we've touched on. Door handles are high touch points. You obviously need to continue to wear your masks, physical distance and follow hand hygiene protocols. You can see in this visual, there are plastic crates. There are a couple of people working very closely together. We've got metal bars. We've got the plastic pipes from the watering systems. Here we've got more metal bars, um, wooden crates. We've got a register with a pen. Here we are in one of the packing houses where we have knives, we have plastic punnets, we have the stainless steel surfaces, we have the scales to weigh things, we have the chairs that we move around. All of these things can potentially uh, have particle dependent transmission of the virus. So it's in, so important to communicate the importance of the preventative measures because of the surface to person transmission. Here we can see we have a photo where not everyone is wearing their mask correctly. You must cover your nose. Um, and again, we have someone here not wearing a mask at all. Please to encourage everybody to continue all preventative measures and to wear their masks properly. Here in terms of, of supply chain, we obviously have steering wheels, safety belts, gear sticks, every, the door handles, everything else you find in cars and, and transport mechanisms in terms of freighting of goods, movement of cardboard boxes, and everything else pertaining to, to getting the product to the end supply. Here's an AV touching on surface to person um, issues with, within, with, within the farm and supply chain logistics. I'm so tired of COVID. Do you think we really need to carry on with all these preventative measures? Absolutely we do. There are so many things that we need to think about. Like what? In addition to working with everyone, think of all the things that we touch every day. When we are catching the tartu or boda boda to work, arriving at work, sitting in the canteen, harvesting and picking, pack houses, farm transport and loading, receiving and issuing goods, stores. We need to make sure that all of the surfaces that we work with are regularly cleaned and sanitized. We need to talk to our manager if we feel sick or if someone at home has COVID. This is really important so that we can all stay safe. So again, in terms of asking your teams about viruses and their survival, how long can they survive on steel and plastic, something you work with every day, up to three days, and what are the risks of the virus being transferred? It's understanding the particle dependency and, and how the particles will be more intensified should someone cough and sneeze, even if you cough into your hand or sneeze into your hand, you then touch a pen. That's why it's recommended that everybody sneeze into their elbows, but at the same time, it's mask wearing, hand washing and, and distancing. So now we move it on to staying safe at home, because obviously if you're not safe at work, you might not be safe at home. And if you're not safe at home, you might not be safe at work. Within our communities and our daily lives, we're also on public transport, we're going to the shops, 
we're moving around, we're interacting, and all of that contributes to the things we touch and the risk we put ourselves at. It's also really important to know what's happening in your community. So you might find some low risk parts of your country, um, there's not a lot happening in your community, but there might be some high risk areas near your capital cities, or possibly at some of the border points where there's a, a lot of crossing um, and transport logistics across border points. So understand not only what is happening within your home and your family and your friends, but also what is happening in the broader community. You can find this information out from your local facilities or word of mouth that, or the Ministry of Health, that as you understand what's happening, the more cases there are, the more you run the risk of bringing that back home. So to reinforce what many of you already know, wash your hands when you come home, clean frequently touched surfaces, keep your windows and doors open for good ventilation, keep soap and water at the entrance and in your living area, talk with your family members about your concerns, let's all be honest, let's not be scared of this, keep meetings small and outside, obviously wearing your masks and, and distancing. If one of your family might have had a possible exposure, you all need to be very supportive of that person and of each other. And at the same time, you need to maintain your social distance and have the person wear a mask, wash their hands and sanitize regularly. If you do have a COVID positive member at home, do not come to work. When you have a family member in your immediate home who has symptoms or who is confirmed COVID positive, tell your manager immediately. Call your government COVID-19 hotline. And if at all possible, try and put your family member into another room or as far apart from the rest of you as possible. If it's not possible, to put them in another room, then all family members must wear masks and sanitize properly. Keep eating utensils separate and wash them well with soap and water. In terms of laundry and bedding, again, keep that separate and wash it with soap and water and dry them in the sun. Keep your immunity systems healthy by eating as many fruit and vegetables as possible and fresh foods. Limit any interactions, for example, cooking together. Again, keep your windows, doors open. Keep the ventilation coming through. We're seeing the more ventilation there is, the less chance there is of the respiratory droplets staying in the air. Don't allow visitors to come to the house. And you must do this for 10 days or until such time that the symptoms have gone. Another thing we've seen is because people are fearful of COVID-19 and they worry about what the community members think, they don't go to the hospital or the local clinic or even the clinic at the farm. You must go because if you let the symptoms become worse, you, you run the risk of, of having very, very serious symptoms and needing to be hospitalized in ICU you also run the risk of spreading the illness further. Here's another AV for you. If you keep safe outside, you will be safe at home. I was telling my neighbor that if you stay safe outside of your home, you will keep everyone at home protected. I agree. We all need to be very aware shopping, taking public transport, visiting public places, and when using communal taps, basins and toilets. What will you do if you or one of your family tests positive? I will let my manager, friends and neighbours know. We will all need to isolate. You need to keep all surfaces and utensils clean with soap and water. When my family comes to visit, we don't shake hands, kiss or hug. We only meet outside and we keep our meetings short. It is important that we do our part. It will protect our communities and fellow workers and it will help to end this sooner. Keep your contacts safe. So again, a couple of questions that you might find um, in your questionnaire survey at the end of it. Do I need to wear a mask if I'm caring for someone infected in my household? Absolutely, yes, you do. Do 
Do I need to isolate if a family member has tested positive for COVID-19, even if I have no symptoms? Yes, you do. You need to notify your management. You need to notify the ministry um, and, and make, it's critical that you stay home and away from others in order for us to prevent the spread. At the beginning of the outbreak, we saw a number of stigmas um, and, and extreme fear around contracting COVID and what this meant within communities. Um, I think as the COVID-19 virus, as we now have more awareness and it's been with us for over a year and a half, there is more understanding, but there are still a few stigmas around it and you need to show you know, that, in, that you're kind and caring, demonstrating that you aren't afraid of people who've recovered from the disease. People who've recovered are absolutely fine and they're not contagious. Another thing you need to understand is that all of you could potentially contract COVID-19, regardless of who we are, where we are, our age, our gender, anything else anybody can get COVID. We've seen that through country leadership, we've seen it through people in our communities. So you cannot hold, um, you, you cannot fear someone who's had it. You need to bear in mind that that person could be you. Discrimination of one person is a risk to all people. So we need to communicate within our communities, within our homes, we need to support our family, friends and neighbours, as well as our medical responders who are helping support us in fighting this virus. Cases not being reported because of the fear leaves more of us exposed and more of us with the chance of contracting this virus. Here's another AV for you on some of the stigmas that we've seen. My doctor was telling me that you will only catch COVID from someone positive if you haven't been following preventative guidelines. Do you think I'll catch COVID from someone who sneezes or coughs? They may not even have COVID, but it's still important to protect yourself. Do you know that it is possible to have COVID with no symptoms? Apparently, 9 out of 10 people who test positive have no symptoms and may not know that they have the virus, which is why it's so important to protect ourselves. Did you hear that one of the Packers recovered from COVID? She had been too scared to go for a test as she was worried about what people would think. Yes, I heard that. And her doctor told her that she would have recovered more quickly if she had gone for a test early. My aunt has just recovered from COVID. She had a fever, dry cough, and was short of breath. Do you think it's safe to see her? Yes. Once someone has fully recovered from COVID, you can safely engage with them again. You must still continue to follow all preventative measures for your interactions with everyone else. I'm so scared. What do you think will happen if I get COVID? Many people have had COVID and have not been tested. Of those who have tested positive, over 98 out of 100 recover and live healthy lives. People who are elderly or sick are the most at risk. We need to make sure that everyone is protected. A couple of questions for you. Do people that have tested po positive for COVID-19 have it for life? No, they don't. And as communicated earlier, you can research all of these guidelines on the likes of the CDC or the WHO websites. The one, the one um, advisory point that the CDC does recommend is for those who are immune compromised. So somebody who has diabetes, or a heart condition or high blood pressure um, or has had a severe case of COVID-19 should isolate for at least 20 days after the onset of symptoms. Will I lose my job if I get COVID-19 and can't report to work? Absolutely not. You need to talk to your employer. You need to discuss this. You need to talk to your local Ministry of Health for guidance and in the meantime, stay at home and isolate if at all possible. Will I get enough oxygen if I wear my mask over my nose and over my mouth? Yes, you will. It doesn't lead to oxygen deficiency and you just need to make sure that your mask fits properly 
and that it's tight enough to allow you to breathe normally. Another point to remember is you mustn't reuse a disposable mask and you must always change it as soon as it gets damp. If I'm young and healthy, can I still get COVID? Yes, we've seen this more and more and we're seeing, we're seeing um, a number of young people take up a greater percentage of those contracting COVID. And as young people, whilst you, whilst young people might not get, feel too ill or get too ill, they still run the risk of taking it home with them and affecting their families and their parents and their grandparents. So it's important for everybody of every age to follow the preventative measures, good hand and good respiratory hygiene. Management can help alleviate the stigma and correct myths by communicating regularly and leading by example. So it's up to you as management, you need to wear your masks properly. You need to be seen to be getting a vaccine as soon as you are able to. You need to wash and sanitize your hands and surf surfaces. You need to wash your hands for a minimum of 20 seconds. Your teams need to see you doing that. You need to follow all COVID-19 protocols um, and maintain physical distance. And you can share regular and up-to-date information from the Ministry of Health or the CDC or WHO. You need to avoid spreading information from sources that are not trusted. We've seen a lot of fake news on Facebook, Twitter, other ch channels, and you need to look at where that information is coming from. And if you hear someone talking about information that is not credible, you need to correct them and you need to tell them to look at the right sources for information. Another really important point to remember is we've seen through COVID that we've had a number of issues pertaining to gender. Workers have experienced increased responsibilities at home, more stress, having to homeschool children, pressure to provide additional meals, or even if there's lost income, to make your income stretch further. And as management, you need to support everybody through initiatives that can support, support women and men who might be having issues at home. As we've seen globally, we've seen a number of gender-based violence and harassment issues. We've seen reduced access to health services. We've seen financial hardships as well as reduced access to childcare. As management, we need to have an open door policy so that anybody can come and talk to us about these issues. We need to reassure, reassure them that there will be no judgment should they choose to share these issues and that they will be confidential. You need to help everybody through this stressful time. So moving on to outbreak management protocols, and this is really, really important in terms of should we have cases on the farm? And we urge you to download uh, the, the toolkit after this presentation and go through the guidelines and these SOPs in detail. Getting back to communicating with teams, it's vital that your teams understand what the farm will do. Should there be a confirmed case or a number of cases on the farm? Because if they understand that now, there will be less panic and less fear at the time in which the positive cases present themselves or an outbreak happens. In terms of the management protocols, we have got three scenarios. Scenario one, which means there are no COVID cases on the farm, but we obviously need to keep it that way and follow the preventative measures. We have scenario two, which has a suspected or a confirmed case on the farm. And then scenario three, which is when we have more than one case on the farm and a potential outbreak, which could seriously impact on, on work and productivity levels, as well as all of your health. Looking at the various scenarios, we've developed a number of forms for you, and I urge you to go through these sheets in more detail. 
we have a temperature checklist, we have the farm surveillance checklist if somebody returns to work for management to follow in terms of where they've been um, and if they have any symptoms. Obviously, if you have a clinic on the farm, your medic on the farm can help with, with the medical surveillance of a case. Should someone have symptoms, you, if you don't have a clinic, you can obviously refer them to, to your closest clinic. We then have a suspected case register, which is the most important form. And what, only one person should have responsibility for this form. This form is gonna help you understand what is happening everywhere on the farm. So please all look at this form, explain it to your teams. It is vital that this form is completed daily and that there's overall one person responsible for it. We then have contract tracing forms and we monitor those contacts at the farm and at home. We have a prevention checklist and I'm sure you all have those measures in place already. And then we have a risk assessment and mitigation measures for you to look at in more detail should you identify any cases on the farm. So just to give you an idea of what these forms look like, on the left we have the temperature checklist, we then have the farm surveillance form which takes and enables management to take you through symptoms and see if someone's a suspected case or not and what to do. We have medical surveillance checklists for the clinic, medics to follow, the suspected case register which is vital um, to identify risk areas on the farm and then we have the farm and the home contact tracing and monitoring uh, and should someone have COVID we then follow up with them for a 14 day period should there be a suspected case or a confirmed case and we do that both at, on the farm and for, for staff members who are living at home. As mentioned, we have a prevention checklist and depending on the severity of COVID on the farm, this, can be, this checklist can be run weekly if there are no cases, uh, where you have all areas checked and screened for hand washing, mask wearing, hand um, social distancing, material sharing, and which sections of the farm. And then form nine, the risk mitigation register, identifies many more areas and what the risk in that area would be. So obviously if you've, if you've had one or two people from the farm in the hardware or in the spraying unit um, contract COVID, those are the higher risk areas and you identify what to do in order to put mitigation measures in place. Um, so these are the forms. There are flowcharts that accompany them that will take you through what to do. Here are the scenarios in more detail. Scenario one, as I said, is um, should there be no, no cases, but obviously you need to continue to follow all the prevention. I think another really important part, getting back to communication, is communication, communicating regularly and sharing this material regularly, share the slides, share the AVs, have a look at the daily stats that are happening to update your teams. Communicate to them now what is gonna happen if there's a suspected case or if there, if there are confirmed cases. As discussed, it's really, really important that they know this now. Point out everything that, that will, will happen um, and use the documents as identified here. In terms of scenario three, form four is your most crucial form. And again, you need to have managed expectations on what will happen? It may be, may be necessary to reallocate alternative work to different spaces on the farm. It may be necessary to put farm activities on hold. It may be necessary to fumigate the entire premises. So be aware of that and communicate that to your teams now. So if we look at COVID cases and looking at scenario two, what defines a suspected case of COVID-19? This is a person who's experiencing symptoms, fever, cough, shortness of breath, 
extreme fatigue, loss of taste and smell. And they have these symptoms after having traveled within the last 14 days to an area where there's high risk or they have come into contact with someone who has tested positive or is likely positive. Close contact means being in the same room and not having followed any of the preventative measures. You will see more detailed definitions of these in the guidelines. In the event of multiple positive COVID-19 cases in the workplace, what is the first measure that must be taken to prevent further spread? You must identify all of your high-risk employees. So those are people who have underlying medical conditions or they're people over the age of 60. You need to make sure that you reduce the risk of COVID contracting them. So moving on to vaccines, and, and this is obviously a more recent development, and we're still seeing the, the rollouts taking place um, across the African continent and, and taking place quite slowly. But please, we encourage you to get vaccines as soon as you're able to. We encourage you to encourage your teams to get vaccines uh, because the vaccine will give you protection from COVID-19. A vaccine stimulates your immunity system to, a COVID vaccine will stimulate your immunity system to, to, to protect you from that disease. We're already seeing COVID-19 vaccines showing great success in protecting people. And, and should they by any chance get it, their symptoms are very, very mild, so they do not run the risk of developing more serious cases. Given a lot of the research that we've been doing um, on vaccines, we've also produced an AV on this, and I'm going to start off taking you through this AV, which will hopefully answer any of some of the questions you and your team may have. I'm not sure I want to get the vaccine. How can it be safe when it was approved so quickly? The vaccination has been through various rounds of research and testing and is now safe and effective. Millions of doctors have been vaccinated, as have people like the Obamas. But I saw a video where a woman collapsed after receiving it. This was not related to the vaccine. The woman confirmed that she had a problem with fainting spells. If I get the vaccine, will it give me COVID-19? No, this is fake news. It won't give you COVID. After you get the vaccine, you will have less chance of getting infected with COVID-19. And even if you do get infected, it will help you from getting seriously ill. Have you had the vaccine? Yes, it is safe and helps to protect the people around you and even stopping the pandemic. Did you have any side effects? No, but you could have mild side effects for one or two days, which is normal after any vaccination. A friend has had the vaccine, which was fine. I now think that we all need to have it. Prevention is better than cure. Yes, we all need to have it to protect ourselves and our loved ones. Vaccines save lives. So I think um, what's really important in terms of vaccines for all of you, and, and again, you can, you can go to a number of information sources and Q&A online, but the kind of questions we've been getting is, are the vaccines safe? They've been developed really, really quickly. Um, is it going to give you better and longer community? in terms of getting COVID as opposed to actually having the vaccine? Do you need to have the vaccine if you have had COVID? Um, and in terms of, of the safety, and you would have seen in the AV, there've been many, many clinical trials. Globally, no vaccines are approved in a hurry. What we've seen is because of the global severity and impact on, of COVID-19, the world has really come together the world's best scientists have come together to develop the vaccine. Because COVID-19 is also part of the coronavirus family, we already had a lot of insight into coronavirus prior to COVID-19. This insight has also contributed to the research. In terms of COVID giving you better and longer immunity than the vaccine can give, both of these are new. 
we don't know how long the protection lasts. The, the current scientific evidence is indicating that it should last for up to 12 months. And if you get COVID, you will be giving it to your loved ones. So getting a COVID-19 vaccine is, um, is, is absolutely the safest choice. The most common side effects of getting the vaccine, as we've seen a painful arm in the area where you've had the vaccine, you might be a little bit tired or have a headache or muscle pain or chills or fever. Often when people have vaccines, they get side effects. This is perfectly normal and they will go away. The symptoms will go away after a few days. When I had my COVID vaccine, I felt absolutely fine. And then I had a bit of a sore and sensitive arm that lasted for a few days. Some people have symptoms, some people have no symptoms. But if you get symptoms, you mustn't worry. The vaccine, as I said, um, it looks like the protection will be up for up to a year, but this is ongoing research. We also know that it doesn't hurt. Um, and as I said earlier, the symptoms go away very, very quickly. What, what, when you get those symptoms, what it means is that the virus is doing exactly what it, we need it to do. It's in your system and we need it to help your system build up immunity so that it protects you from the disease. Again, there have been a number of questions about what we don't know and what about long-term problems and all of the up-to-date information on this you can find online. Um, there are also questions around, do I need to wear a mask after I've received both doses of the vaccine? Whilst we are building up immunity in the world, yes, we still need to wear masks. You need to protect yourself and others, and you need to follow all of the preventative re recommendations that we've taken you through earlier. A number of people have again asked um, if, they, if they have an underlying condition, whether it's possible to get the vaccine. If you are aware of having any reactions to the ingredients within the vaccine, you need to talk to your doctor. Um, if you don't have any allergies to that, the vaccine ingredients, then it is still recommended that, that you are vaccinated. But if you do have any concerns, you can talk to your healthcare practitioner. Can you be vaccinated whilst you have COVID? No. People with COVID who have the symptoms need to be wait to be vaccinated until they've recovered and have also met the criteria for discontinuing isolation. Those without symptoms who are testing positive should also wait until they get vaccinated. If, if I've had COVID and recovered, do I need to be vaccinated? Absolutely you do. Can the vaccine give me COVID-19? None of the vaccines have the ability to cause COVID, though they may, they may trigger side effects, as we've already communicated. Another question we've, we've had many people ask a lot of in the last couple of weeks is, um, are the vaccines, the AstraZeneca vaccine from India safe? Uh, you know, we look at India and we see that they're really, really struggling with COVID. Um, they're struggling to keep on top of it. Their hospitals are falling over. Many people are dying. And here we've been told to take a vaccine that is manufactured in India. Everyone needs to understand that the vaccination rate in India has been extremely low. India has a population of over a billion people. So to try and get all of those people vaccinated is going to take a very, very long time. And at the time when they were having such problems, less than 10 million people had been vaccinated. The COVAX AstraZeneca vaccine is proven to be safe. It's the one I've had. It's the one many people I know have had, and it's highly recommended. Having the vaccine is better than having no vaccine. We've also had a number of questions around fertility and pregnancy 
And again, we urge you to, to do some more research, to talk about this with your teams. There is absolutely no evidence to suggest that COVID-19 impacts on your facility or on the development of your placenta and your baby. People of a reproductive age should all have the COVID-19 as soon as they are able to. In terms of infertility, there are also a number of studies on this. And then again, there's no evidence or reason that any of the vaccines can affect fertility. In fact, now that we've seen that the, vaccine, that the virus has been with us for over a year and a half, looking at fertility rates of tracking all of those people in the world who've had COVID, there've been no changes in the statistics from a fertility perspective. So there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that this pandemic has changed fertility patterns. If natural infection having COVID hasn't altered fertility, why would the vaccine do that? So again, you need to explain, understand that and explain that to your teams. So that's the overall content and, and we urge you to go through the content and all of the other documents that you have in this link. Uh, you've got this presentation, you have the posters for display, you have all of the audio visual clips um, in English, I'm Harik Swahili and Shona. There's a text messaging campaign you can share with your colleagues. You can share the AV clips on WhatsApp. They're at the right size to be able to do that. And then the outbreak management SOPs, which we urge you to share with your teams up front. This is an example of the posters that we have in the various languages that you can print off. Again, you can circulate them through um, WhatsApp. And we know that a number of farms have also provided these posters to the surrounding community as they have with the WhatsApp messaging. So we encourage you to do the same. Additional sources in terms of where to get more information, particularly looking at the more sensitive issues like fertility and infertility um, and people trying to, to fall pregnant. Uh, please go onto these information sources to get more information to share with your team. And as reiterated earlier, please only go on to credible sources. There's too much fake news out there. And in order for us to really get on top of COVID-19, we need to share appropriate and accurate information. There's a survey monkey questionnaire for you to complete on the, on the, um, on the link. And it will only take you two minutes. It certainly won't take you very long at all. So please complete that and we will share you um, share with you the, the results and a certificate within a week. Thank you all once again for attending today. We know that everybody's a little bit tired of COVID-19. We are seeing some increased positivity rates in Africa. We are also venturing into winter. Please make sure that we all stay safe. Now is not the time. We, we are tired of this virus, but we still need to protect and mitigate. It's really, really important. We need to thank UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, together with Mark MacDonald, Partner Africa, and ETI for all of their support in enabling us to deliver this training to you. Best of luck to all of you. Thank you for your time and stay safe.